Hello friends, old and new, and welcome to the Maypril wrap-up, aka the books I read in April and May while I was having migraine on migraine and didn't have a lot of time to film but did have a lot of time to read and I would love to tell you about some of the books I read because they were good. They were, a lot of them were really, really good. So this is part two where I'll be talking about books pertaining to horror, especially family family horror is the best way to set it, um, short stories, as well as some light reading. If you're more into nonfiction, science fiction, or literary fiction, that is part one of the Maypril wrap-up. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I read 21 books in Maypril, and that would have been way too long of a video. So here we are. Let's go. Let's dive in. So I knew that this book was being made into a movie, and I also had a friend recommend it to me a while back as a, like, fun novella that she thought I would enjoy. And I had been putting it off and I have so many regrets because I loved it so much. It was a five star read for me and I know that this seems like an unpopular opinion because it does not have a good Goodreads rating. But that book is The Cabin at the End of the World. I loved it. I loved it so much. So I know it's been adapted into a movie relatively recently and I also looked up to see what gets changed plot-wise between the book and the movie, and it's a lot, and I think it's one of the most important plot points actually that gets changed, so I don't plan on seeing the movie, but I loved the book. If you know nothing about this, let me set the scene. We're following seven-year-old Wen, she's seven or eight, and she is the adopted child of two men, and they're hanging out in this remote cabin in the woods just having a lovely summer. Wen is catching grasshoppers as little children do when they're at a cabin over the summer. I know I did that a lot. And suddenly, um, like, another grown-up approaches her and starts chatting with her about her grasshoppers, and then he says, what's about to happen isn't your fault. Like, I'm sorry for what's about to happen, it's not your fault. Really freaking ominous. Really ominous. Girl, you gotta run inside. And what ends up happening is that the stranger arrives with three other strangers, so there's four in total, and they first surround the house that the little family barricades itself in and eventually make their way in. And they say that the world's ending, hence the cabin at the end of the world. The world is ending, and the only way for it to not end is that the two men, the two fathers, and their daughter have to choose one of them, one of the three needs to be willingly sacrificed and killed by the other two, and only that will prevent the end of the world. Obviously, they don't believe this, and <laughs> they resist these four strangers who have come to impose this on them, these four strangers that are very clearly the four um, horse riders of the apocalypse, and this gets me to what I liked about this book. There were so many, like, illusions and metaphors and like little like things to clue in on. What I really liked was Paul Tremblay actually wrote out a guide to it at the end of his book. He's like, here I was referencing the yellow wallpaper, here I was referencing this horseman of the apocalypse. And I really liked that. I thought it was a really fun way to explore these ideas that have been culturally present for a while and I think he did it in a really interesting way. I found the book very compelling. I found it the perfect length. I've seen a lot of complaints that it should have been a short story. I see why people say that, but I found it so compelling and I didn't want it to end and I just was so satisfied with how it went and with the ending. It surprised me. It shocked me. I found it very well written. I absolutely loved it. So then I became curious about Paul Tremblay and I thought, okay, well, let's see what else he's written. And then I found a book that was written literally for me and now lives rent-free in my head. And that is A Head Full of Ghosts. These ghosts live rent-free up here now. This book was so good. <laughs> like, if Cabin at the End of the World is five stars, I, I don't know what A Head Full of Ghosts was for me. It was probably is going to be one of my favorite books that I read that I read this year. I can already feel that. And part of that is because the premise is very close to home for me. So the premise is that... We follow the perspective of Meredith, called Mary, and she is a preteen who has who lives in a big house with her parents and her older sister. And at the beginning of the book, her older sister starts to display some strange behaviors 
that are explained both by early onset schizophrenia as well as by being haunted and possessed by a demon. And we sort of have this very claustrophobic um, helplessness with having Mary as our narrator because she is navigating watching her parents struggle with her sister's illness and watching her sister suddenly get terrifying and violent and menacing towards her. And what's really cool is we get the narration both from Mary when she's a preteen, but the story is actually framed as her being interviewed by a journalist 20 years later as an adult. And as an adult, recounting some stuff that has never, ever been leaked to the public. Because the thing is, they are actually a very famous family. Because the parents, once they couldn't afford the older sister's medical treatments anymore and had run out of ideas, and the father was falling more and more into religious fanaticism, decided that it's time to exercise the sister. And that it would make for very good TV. So this poor girl... I mean, these poor girls have a live, not a, not a live, but have a um, film crew come to their house to film reality TV and to film reenactments of past things that, like past events that the parents describe happening. And some of them are like really disturbing, like very, very, um, very disturbing and very clearly based on The Exorcist. And I haven't seen or read The Exorcist, but this book made me want to. Um, and what I really appreciated was, again, Paul Tremblay's making these references to pop horror that are so, like, obvious but fun. I really enjoyed it. Like, there's a room with yellow wallpaper. Again, the man just loves the yellow wallpaper. Um, there's great references to our main character's name, Mary. She's the younger sister, and her older sister calls her Mary the Cat. And if you've read Shirley Jackson's We Have Always Lived in the Castle, Shirley Jackson is referenced a lot in terms of Hill House, but We Have Always Lived in Castle is only referenced when Mary's called Mary the Cat. But if you've read it, it is excellent foreshadowing, excellent, excellent foreshadowing to what ends up, what happens. And I don't, I don't want to spoil either books for you, but it was so delightful. It was just the most delightful and satisfying reference. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then lots of references to modern horror movies as well as modern horror fiction. There's a little character called Stephen Graham Jones who's like a tutor just randomly for the girls. He like appears halfway through, which is, I thought that was adorable. It's just Paul Tremblay being like, yo, Stephen, I like your work. Um, and that's wholesome. I like that. I really liked this book so much. I just found it so... I found it extremely compelling. I could not put it down. And I say I couldn't put it down. I listened to the audiobook and I listened to it in less than 24 hours. I could literally not stop. I stayed up late listening to it because it was just so good. It was so good. I found it so compelling. I found the perspective amazing. I found the narration uh, well-written, hilarious, engaging, sad, thought-provoking, all these kinds of things. And again, this is not a book for everyone, and neither is The Cabin at the End of the World. I think a lot of people would not like it, but there are multiple reasons why they were five-star reads for me, and just, I cannot wait to read more Paul Tremblay. I am a big fan. I'm a big, big fan of the kind of stuff he writes. Um, yeah, so turns out I love family horror, especially when it's written like this, and it was great. And right before I read these, it actually, uh, I read some other family horror, so it really ties in very nicely. And that was Grady Hendrix's How to Sell a Haunted House. This actually came out on my birthday, January 17th of this year. And I was like, oh, a book for me. How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix is a book about a cursed puppet, which is normally like not my my cup of tea like I don't really care about like cursed puppets and dolls and all that kind of stuff but the cursed puppet is a metaphor for grief <laughs> it's a metaphor for a sibling rivalry slash disdain of two siblings and for grief of um losing their parents very very suddenly so we follow a woman who is a single mother to a five-year-old child and She's doing the single mothering thing really well, but especially because her parents, even though they live across the country, frequently visit 
come and help out. It's awesome. And things are pretty good for her, other than the fact that she's estranged from her brother, who she feels was always kind of, um, didn't, like, was always made excuses for and didn't really have to, like, put in any effort into anything. And his parents always kind of coddled him while she had to, like, really fight for her own. So she and her brother don't really speak and they don't get along. And at the beginning of the book, she finds out that both her parents, the grandparents of her little girl, suddenly die in a car accident. And she is super shaken by this and really upset. And when she flies back to where her parents live, her brother has already made funeral arrangements. And they're trying to figure out what to do with the house. Because <laughs> there's, there's a house that needs to be sold. And there's issues with the will that I won't get into, but that really create a lot of family drama. Because who doesn't love some will family drama? So there's these issues with the will. And what we start to find out is that the mom like the little girl's grandma, the parent of these two adults who are now, who is now dead. Um, she was a puppeteer and she has a lot, a lot of creepy puppets. Including, oh, I can't even remember this puppet's name, but he still haunts my dreams a little bit. It's not Pippin, but it's something like Pippin. Um, what a creepy puppet. What a, what a creepy puppet. <laughs> And this puppet basically acts that he is the favorite child and he needs to be the favorite child. And he really tries to possess other humans and he effectively haunts the house of these deceased grandparents. And the two siblings have to settle their differences to deal with this puppet. A lot happens. A lot happens. Some of it's very gruesome. This puppet is evil. This puppet is pure evil and they cannot get rid of him. Like you throw him in the trash, he reappears the next day kind of thing. You burn him alive, he reappears the next day. This puppet cannot be killed. And at some point, our main character brings her little daughter. Like she go flies back to her daughter and then the puppet appears where her little girl is and starts to possess the five-year-old in a really, really creepy, disturbing way. So then you have to separate the puppet from the five-year-old whose life force is being sucked by the puppet. Anyway, did I actually like this book? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I genuinely did. Um, I feel like Grady Hendrix is like pretty unpopular in the booktube review world. Like I've seen a lot of people be like, this is not great horror, but honestly, if you take Grady Hendrix as a humor horror writer who explores some interesting ideas, but doesn't take himself very seriously, which is really how I'm reading it, these books are very enjoyable. Like, I found just found this a fun ride. Like, I just really enjoyed my experience of reading it. I found myself entertained. I still remember the plot, even though it's been like two months since I read it, because it was a genuinely entertaining reading experience, and I just had like a good time. And it's truly one of those horrors that's like, what's spookier? A haunted puppet or a terrifying family dynamic? You know it's the for terrifying family dynamic. It's much easier to fight a creepy puppet. Um, so this was a four-star read for me. I do recommend it, especially if you've read other Grady Hendrix and you kind of like his writing style. He really sort of does more of what he does well when writing this book. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to reading more. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other of his books on my TBR and I'm really excited for them because I really enjoy his writing style and just the kind of stuff that he does with books. It's fun. I hesitated whether to put this book on literary horror or litfic, but, uh, sorry, family horror or litfic, but the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know what, I think this is supposed to be horror. I think it's kind of supposed to be horror, and this is the only physical book I read in April, and that's largely because when I have a lot of chronic pain, I'm not able to hold books very well. It's much easier to listen to audiobooks or read on my Kobo, and I will be making a video about that if you're interested about reading with chronic pain and with migraines, so stay tuned. That was a little plug, but I read this. 
I finished The Vegetarian. I loved it. I annotated it. Um, just a couple of little quotes, little moments. Um, this ended up being a, like a 3.5 rounded down uh, read for me, but I did find it really interesting. So we follow a woman who, um, a South Korean woman, and she's married, and suddenly she decides that she doesn't want to eat any animal products anymore. It's kind of, the vegetarian is a bit of a misnomer because she goes fully vegan, um, like throwing out eggs and cheese and stuff too. And she throws out a bunch of food and tells her husband that she will not be cooking any animal products anymore and she will only serve them vegetables. And this is a very patriarchal society. Her husband flips out. He's like, woman, what are you doing? So he then like takes her to a family dinner at her parents' house to get her father to like try and command her to eat meat. So we have this very, very like oppressive uh, patriarchal thing going on and she's literally like held down and meat is forced into her mouth. Um, I won't spoil what happens next, but it's dark. This is a very, very dark book and I really, really enjoyed it. So it's kind of written in three parts. I described what happens in the first part and then in the second one, there it's narrated more from her brother-in-law's perspective who is fascinated by her and wants to do a very artful but bizarre like erotic photography project with her. And then the third section of the book is narrated by her sister who fully doesn't understand our main character's descent into what might be madness, what might be clarity. It's very unclear. And this book kind of the best, it, it's no plot, just vibes. It doesn't have a lot of a point. It really just explores ideas. It explores the limits between human, animal, and plant. They say my insides have all atrophied, you know. Yun Hye was lost for words. Yun Hye moved her emaciated face closer to her sister. I'm not an animal anymore, sister, she said, first scanning the empty ward, as if about to disclose a momentous secret. I don't need to eat. Not now. I can live without it all. All I need is sunlight. What are you talking about? Do you really think you've turned into a tree? How could a plant talk? How can you think these things? Yung Hye's eyes shone. A mysterious smile played on her face. You're right. Soon now, words and thoughts will all disappear. Soon. Yung Hye burst into laughter, then sighed. Very soon. Just a bit longer to wait, sister. That's sort of like the creepy vibe of this. Um, I do recommend reading it if any of this sounds enticing to you. It's like, it's gross and misogynistic because it is portraying a very misogynistic and patriarchal way of treating young women. It's a commentary on bodily autonomy, it's a commentary on unconventional behavior and how that's received by society as a whole. It can definitely be really difficult to read, so I don't necessarily recommend it if you're kind of sensitive of depictions of misogyny. This is but probably not the book for you. Um, but I do, I did find this very interesting and extremely well written, extremely well written, which is why it has all these little tabs because there are just some of some of the visuals, some of the imagery is just like lives in my head now and will never leave. Like the photography project that I mentioned, ooh, some of those scenes like they're grotesque and beautiful in the weirdest ways. So yeah, that was The Vegetarian. Three stars. Great stuff. I am so disappointed with the rating that I have to give this book because when I read the concept, I was like, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be amazing commentary on our current sort of like surveillance social media economy that we have where our, our past can be dug up and fabricated to socially shame us and punish us outside of a court of law and all these sorts of like ideas around social media that I keep thinking about and like whether we want to say the cancel culture is real or not but it it just seems like a very apt metaphor for these kinds of things and instead I found that this book did not go deep enough in exploring the ideas and I ended up giving it two stars 
so let's talk about it. That book is I Keep My Exoskeletons to Myself. This is a new release, and it's a new speculative fiction release that is narrated by a woman whose wife dies in childbirth. So our main character, Chris, despises her child. Not overtly, but she definitely doesn't love her child the way that you would expect it to, largely because she sees this kid as having killed the kid's mother, Chris's wife, Bo. And the book is written after Bo's death, Chris speaking to Bo and telling her about what's happening. So it's a second person narration. And we live in this world where you can be given an extra shadow if you commit a crime that harms another person, if you overtly harm another person. So this child, because she effectively killed her mother in childbirth, is born already with a second shadow. And shadow stirs, or whatever they're called, I forget exactly, but some kind of neologism like that. Shadow stirs are second-class citizens in the society. They can't rent certain apartments, they can't shop in certain grocery stores or with certain hours, like they, they're they very much restricted and restricted for life. And for life are socially ostracized and seen as other and seen as lesser than and seen as evil. So this child is born tarnished, essentially. And the thing is that Chris, our main character, also has an extra shadow and we don't find out for most of the book why she has that extra shadow. But instead, we watch her experience her life where because she and her child both have extra shadows, she's under constant surveillance. There are cameras in her house constantly watching her. If they see that she does something wrong, people will literally show up at her door five minutes later. Um, and her main social circle is other shadow stirs. So the book is written with a lot of vignettes from when the child's born to when she's an early preteen. Like I think seven or eight. And <laughs> I saw another re negative review because I love reading negative reviews of any book, whether I liked it or not. And I saw another negative review that said, it, you know, it's a little, little pushing it that this child is said to be like seven years old and she goes to smoke weed in the park with her friends. Like, mm, 13, maybe seven. It's like we pass the point of shock value into the point of I don't buy this anymore. <laughs> um, but that might just be limited by my own life experiences. It's hard to say. Um, <laughs> but I, I did kind of resonate with that review that I was like, this child is acting and also speaking way old, like, like she's way older than she's supposed to be in the book. But that's a side note. So why did I end up not really liking this? I didn't find the writing very compelling. I didn't find the ideas explored as kind of thoroughly and deeply as I would have wanted to. I guess I have a very high bar for speculative fiction. To me, speculative fiction really needs to dig deep into its themes and not just kind of show us what it says on the tin. Um, while I wrote this in my review, I found this the level of analysis was analogous to like an Instagram infographic. Um, so a couple of buzzwords, a couple of, you know, key phrases, but nothing that really, like, there wasn't a thought that I was like, oh, this is new, this is important, this is something I haven't seen before. So I was pretty disappointed with the read, and I didn't love the experimental writing style, like the second person narration, the very inconsistent, very short vignettes of narration. It doesn't work for me. I know it's very popular right now, but it just did not resonate with me. So while this is not the book for me, I do think, and I actually have a couple of friends in my life who really enjoy like experimental fiction and like experimental queer fiction. If that is the case, I do think you would like this. If you are one of those people, I think you would like this a lot. So like if you're interested in these very like overt discussions of oppression and surveillance, especially through this sort of queer lens. And it, if you don't mind the highly experimental writing and that the focus is lost a little bit from the sci-fi element, that latter part is really what, what I didn't like about it. But if that doesn't bother you, I think you would really enjoy this book. But for me, it was a two-star read. And two stars in my book means... Uh, <laughs> two stars in my book. 
two stars in how I write means not for me, but could definitely be for someone else. And that's all the family horror that I read in April. So my short stories is that they can be absolutely amazing or they can just like be a skip after a skip after a skip. It's a really interesting format though because you can just like throw out a wild concept, run with it, and then 20 pages later be like, okay reader, have fun, have fun with this living in your head now. And that is exactly the energy that Cursed Bunny <laughs> brings. So it's a four star read for me. These stories were so unhinged. They were so unhinged and so gross and there was so much horror and it just kind of like varied in style. It was a really, really interesting grab bag. And like any short story collection, of course it has skips. But this felt like someone had these like insane drug fueled fever dreams. And then they were like, you know what? I'm going to write them down. There's a toilet monster in the first story, and that really is tells you everything you need to know. It's a toilet monster made out of our main character's own uh, discarded bodily fluids. Let's put it that way. That was that was an interesting story to read. I will not lie to you. There's a cursed bunny, as the collection suggests, that has a little bit of a monkey paw vibe, and it's pretty pretty creepy um a lot of the books in here a lot of the books a lot of the short stories in here are like distressing and horrific and gross so if you like to think to yourself what am i reading what what is this why is this happening to me why am i reading this and you can't stop this is a great collection for you and it's one of these things that i don't even want to talk about it too much because the premise of the stories is like the best part of them. <laughs> so I don't want to spoil too many for you, but this is this is weird. This is good weird. It was a four star level of good weird. And I read it super close in time with another short story collection that was very, very similar. Also horror, also good weird. And that was Life Ceremony by Sayaka Murata. And Sayaka Murata is, we all, we all know, she started with convenience store woman. I mean, as the English-speaking literary world, we first experienced her with convenience store women, and we thought, all right, this is great. Then we all were collectively traumatized by earthlings, and we were like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And in life ceremony, Sakamurata continues to ask, why is cannibalism taboo? Why are there these taboos about sex? Why don't we make clothing out of human hair and furniture out of human skin? Why don't we eat each other at funerals? She continues to ask these questions and uses stories to answer them. And if that sounds messed up to you, it's because it is. But if that sounds like a good time to you, it's also because it is. These were fun. And I do recommend having read some Saka Murata before that, and especially Earthlings, because familiar characters come back. Oh yes. Oh yes. We get to see them again in another context. What else is there to love? What else is there to love? <laughs> I also just really like the cover of this, because it's like, ooh, a ramen bowl, and then you look a little closer, and it's like, there's the human heart. Because that's what you do in a life ceremony, my dears. You eat grandpa sometimes <laughs> what's that grammar joke let's eat grandma let's eat grandpa this is the book that asks why not eat grandma she's going to waste otherwise <laughs> four stars i loved it and i read one other short story collection but it does not compare it pales in comparison to this Korean and Japanese horror that I read, and that is Old Babes in the Wood by Margaret Atwood. I got this as an arc, and as grateful as I am for it, I did not enjoy the book. I just did not enjoy it. I found it a little bit of a chore. Margaret Atwood is a great writer, don't get me wrong. Some of my favorite books are Atwood books, but some of her books have bored me to tears. 
Um, basically, I like certain things that she writes, but there are a lot that I don't like. And Old Babe in the Woods, Old Babes in the Wood, Old Babes in the Wood, Old Babes in the Wood really leaned more into the parts of Outlook that I don't like, that I find slow and uninteresting and... It feels like there's supposed to be something there, and there's supposed to be, like, layers, and you infer a lot about what the character's thinking and feeling, and I can see why that appeals to some people, and it appeals to me when done in a different way, but I don't like the way that she does it specifically. I don't find it enjoyable. Like, if you are looking for, let's say, Handmaid's Tale or Oryx and Craig, that's not here. If you are looking for Cat's Eye, um, that is here. <laughs> trying to remember what's the one that I read, Bodily Harm. If you're looking for Bodily Harm, that's also kind of in here. If you're looking for the edible woman, kind of, kind of, the better stories in this collection reminded me of the edible woman. But all in all, this collection divided into three parts, where parts one and three follow the same couple um, and a couple of different, and we read a couple of different vignettes from their lives, um, including before and after one of the members of the couple, um, die. <laughs> so in part one, they're both alive. In part two, in part three, only one of them's alive. And in part two, there's some random unrelated stories that I guess Margaret Atwood was like, this is too short. You know what? I have these, I have these randoms hanging around agent would you mind putting them in the middle of this book and the agent went yeah that's a good idea people will buy you your Margaret Atwood <sighs> so yeah I didn't really enjoy this this was a two-star read for me I recommend it if you're an Atwood completionist but otherwise this is largely skippable at least if you're coming at it with my perspective this is largely skippable I'm not a fan <laughs> sorry Margaret I love you anyway but no, no. We've reached the chillest part of April. This is the grab bag of reads that, like, weren't too serious, we're kind of just for fun, and I'm gonna go from worst to best for this because I like to end on a high note. So the worst of the reads just for fun, and it feels bad calling this the worst because it was very wholesome, was another advanced reader's copy that I got, and it's Beth Evans' collection, um, Thinking of You. What's it called? But not, like, in a weird, creepy way. Thinking of you, but not like in a weird, creepy way, in a I love you way. And this book is really cute. It's really just a collection of Instagram uh, comics, like single panel square comics that give sort of a generic feel good, you're doing your best vibes. Really adorable. It's sickeningly sweet. <laughs> After a while, it's really not a book you can actually leave through quickly if you're trying to get all the content because it does get really repetitive. So while I appreciate that Beth Evans collected all of her work, I find it works so much better as an Instagram post. And I do like her on Instagram and I do really enjoy her work, but it just didn't work for me as a book. It felt a little too sickeningly sweet, superficial. I ended up giving it three stars and that broke my heart a little because again, I love her work, but I just found the way it was put in a book, it didn't work for me, especially because I know of other other comic artists who have put together their illustrations into books in a way that's far more interesting, in a way that's far more compelling and diverse. And I was really hoping that there would be a little bit more of an organization, a little bit more of a setup, and not just really the Instagram posts bound in a book. So take from that what you will. That said, the comics are adorable, the style is adorable, and it's very wholesome. So three stars because wholesome. <laughs> Who doesn't like wholesome? So no one is more surprised than me that I decided to try and read a romance novel. No one is more surprised than me. I tried. I didn't hate it. It was a three star, three and a half star even. And part of the reason that I wanted to read it actually it was because the main character has fibromyalgia and I don't know if that's what I have maybe who knows but I definitely relate to a lot of her experiences especially now that I've been experiencing so much chronic pain so in case you haven't guessed it already that book was Get a Life Chloe Brown which follows the main character Chloe Brown in 
who turns 30, moves out of her parents' apartment, and or her, her really rich parents' house, moves into her own apartment, and decides she needs to get a life. She needs to go out, get drunk, she needs to go camping, she needs to do something bad, which is the hilarious thing on the list, and she falls in love with the hunky man who she can see through the window. He's like the superintendent or the minute, like he doesn't own the building. He like takes care of the building. I forgot what the role is called. So we meet Redford and Redford is written for the female gaze in a way that's like <laughs> exhausting. He's like a hunky, super, mas super muscular, masculine guy who's sensitive and guarded and loves his mother and also loves to paint and he's an artist but he's also super strong and muscly and he's also so like in tune with Chloe and a very very generous lover as we get to experience through many many spicy scenes. Is this what you're all reading? Is this what you kids are all reading when you're reading the romance? I expected like two spicy scenes, I got like 12. <laughs> and I listened to, them, to this on audiobook and it was just like really funny having it playing and listening to some of the spicy scenes being read out loud. I actually really recommend it as an experience because it is hilarious. It is not even like hilariously bad, it's just funny. It's just very, very funny to me. And all in all, this is really like a feel-good book. You know what's going to happen. You know Chloe and Redford are going to end up together after they have a couple of miscommunications. And she's not going to be cured of all her ailments. And he's not going to be cured of all his baggage. But they're going to help each other. And it's going to be wholesome. And we just get to see what that looks like. So extremely predictable, formulaic, fun. Hence why I didn't really give it a very high rating, but I did not enjoy it. I can definitely see this, like, it's it's the rom-com of books, and I'm not a romance reader at all. That's not my thing, but I'm really glad that I gave it a shot, and I will probably try one or two other authors, maybe. I've been, like, eyeing Emily Henry and Ali Hazelwood just because I see other people reading them all the time. So maybe I'll give it a shot. If you have a romance book recommendation for people who don't like romance books, like this was fine. This Get a Life Chloe Brown was fine. If you have her other recommendations, I'm interested. I just really don't want to read the Steminist novels because, how do I put this? As a scientist, I don't think I can handle that. <laughs> I don't think I can handle it. It's gonna be, if it's bad, I'm gonna really hate it. And I'm going to find reasons to hate it. And I just don't want to put myself through that experience. If I'm going to read a romance novel, I want to actually enjoy it. Um, yeah, if you have any recommendations, I am all ears. Because sometimes you just got to have a little bit of fun. And I'm going to review these two together. Because in April, I read Good Girl, Bad Blood. And I also read As Good As Dead. <laughs> So the other two books of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. And I quite liked the first book. It was fun. It works very, very well on audio because there were phone interviews. There are podcast clips. There are weird things happening. And Good Girl, Bad Blood, the second book, is really A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, part two, Electric Boogaloo. Um kind of the same formula, kind of the same idea. We dive more into, you know, the secrets of the small town, which is always fun. And our teenage sleuth, Pip, she continues to be her teenage sleuth self, only this time she has her boyfriend on her side. And it's fun. It's fun. It's a, it's a sequel. It's more of the same. Um, there's what is a little bit annoying in this mystery is that there's no way to solve the mystery because the essential clues are withheld from the reader, because they are also withheld from Pip. And we experience everything kind of through her eyes. So if you're looking for a mystery that you can figure out, you will not enjoy this. But if you're just there for the ride, willing to suspend disbelief and just live in this universe for a little bit, it is a fun trip. It is a really good time, which is why I gave it a four-star rating. And As Good As Dead also got a four-star rating, but this book is very different. This book is dark. This book is... <laughs> Pip becomes Lisbeth Salander. 
<laughs> it's the best way I can summarize the plot of this book. Because in As Good As Dead, Pip is getting threatened. So for the first kind of third of the book, there's these really, really creepy threats. And the climax of the book happens in the middle, which is very, very different from how the first two were constructed. So it leaves us readers very unbalanced, which I understand why this book is very polarizing for people who liked the first two. It's very polarizing because I won't say any spoilers beyond Pip becomes Lisbeth Salander. <laughs> And I personally loved it. I was like, yes, Dark Pip, let's go. And I had such a good time with this one. And then just, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I found the the denouement of the last portion of the book very actually satisfying. And again, you have to suspend some disbelief because you cannot believe that this is happening in the real world to a real teenager um, because there's too much there's too much is the best way of putting it but if you accept that this is the universe you're living in and if you accept that there's no such thing as good and bad people just do good or bad things and sometimes we root for the wrong people sometimes we root for the right people for the wrong reasons all that kind of stuff you might have a good time so if you're expecting the first two books in the third, that's not what you're going to get. But if you're prepared for kind of a very different new adventure and character growth that might seem disjointed, it's not, it's not positive character growth, let's put it that way, it's not positive character growth, unless, I mean, Elizabeth Salander, is she a good or a bad character? Hard to say. Pip in this book, we love some moral gray, we love some gray morality, don't we? Anyway, the series was a lot of fun. It's a solid four-star series for me. I really enjoyed it. I like a good thriller. I like a good thriller I can lose myself in and just want to keep reading. And the series really did it for me. I'm not a big series reader, but I'm starting to become one because I am finding these very, very satisfying. And that's all I read in April. It was 21 books and yay! <laughs> Only one of them was physical and everything else. I ended up like I said, having to read either on my Kobo because I was just lying on my side and tapping, or I listened to it while dying of a migraine. Um, but it was a really, really great way actually to spend the month, migrainy month of April. That's my alliteration for the day, the migrainy month of April. Um, I hope you had a wonderful April. I hope you didn't have any migraines. If you did, feel free to commiserate in the comments with me. It's good for my engagement. Um, anyway, I'm happy to be back on YouTube. I'm happy to be doing some more videos. I really, really hope that my health will allow me to keep putting these out more regularly because I love reviewing books and you seem to enjoy my reviews. So stick around, have fun. Um, I'm hoping to do separate videos for June and July. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for being here. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope you read some really amazing books soon. If you liked any of these, if you hated any of these, I wanna know, please tell me. The algorithm loves it when you comment. The algorithm loves it and honestly, so do I. The little serotonin machine goes ding. Okay, I'm gonna say goodbye to them. Bye.